So I thought I would just say um, a few words quickly about what the book is about, presuming that not all of you have <laughs> read it. Um, but first I should say thanks very much for, for having us, um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, so I realized sort of later than you might expect that there's actually a part of the book which describes what the book is going to be about, which is the introduction. Um, <laughs> so I figured I would start by reading a couple paragraphs from the introduction. This book is an account of the relationship between two of the most remarkable political leaders of the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States, and Fiorella LaGuardia, the 99th Mayor of New York City. The products of starkly different personal backgrounds and different reform traditions, they rose in counterpoint through the ranks of New York politics before coming together in the 1930s to form a political collaboration unique between a national and a local official. Sworn in as the executives of America's two largest governments at the depths of the Great Depression, they kept the nation's biggest city together during one of the most trying periods in its history and helped to establish the course of its politics in the post-war decades. This is also a study of how government came to play an extraordinarily broad role in a quintessentially market-oriented city, of how a broader public sphere embodied physically in structures and spaces built up and carved out in the 1930s was forged. This story has its roots in the progressive era, which marked the beginning of a decades-long debate over the ideal relationship among individuals, society, and government. In a modern interdependent society, what rights did each of these groups possess? and what responsibilities? And how could collective action be deployed in the interest of social progress? Particularly in urban politics, the progressive era witnessed the introduction of a new set of urban approaches, of policy approaches, meant to improve the quality of life, mitigate the social costs of capitalist urban development, and render government more efficient and effective. A crucial moment in this history came in the 1930s. During that turbulent decade, Franklin Roosevelt and his Democratic Party chose to channel the resources of the federal government through the agencies of America's cities and counties. Fiorella LaGuardia's coalition of reformers, Republicans, social democrats, and leftists rebuilt New York's local state, chasing the functionaries of the city's fabled Tammany Hall political machine from power and implanting a cohort of technical experts committed to expanding the scope of the public sector. As depression gave way to war, the experience of total mobilization politicized market transactions, allowing grassroots activists and political leaders alike to make fair employment and fair prices a central part of city politics. So much of the book is devoted to showing how choices made by national officials um, really reshaped the bounds of what was possible in New York City's urban politics. Um, the key moment in many ways comes in first in 1933, sort of in a explicitly temporary sense, and then more permanently the following year when um, the Roosevelt administration and the Democratic Congress decide that the way they're going to meet the unemployment crisis is to um, pay unemployed people to work on projects designed and carried out by local governments. And um, this made possible in New York uh, a vast expansion of the scope of the municipal government um, and really breathed life into a progressive agenda which had been building since the late 19th century. Um, a lot of this uh, physical legacy of the New Deal is still with us. LaGuardia Airport, the Triborough Bridge, the Lincoln and Queens Midtown Tunnels, the West Side Highway, the FDR Drive, the zoo in Prospect Park, the Staten Islands, I, 11 swimming pools, public health clinics across, the, it's a lot of stuff. Um, and in many ways, this um, public investment impulse was the center of what the New Deal did. Because um, these New Deal initiatives worked at the community level, they could be carried on even after the New Deal programs, which brought them into being, uh, were discontinued. So the Works Progress Administration, which is the central agency, and this story was phased out in 1943. A lot of the things that it helped the city to do uh, were continued in the post-war era. Um, and I argue in the book that it had much to do with the experience of the Depression years in the city. Um, seeing uh, these displays of government competency enabled citizens to 
think more capaciously about what claims they could assert on the government. So even as these national initiatives went away, um, there was a, developed a robust local politics which comes to make New York in some ways the epicenter of post-war urban liberalism. And, uh, you know, and this liberal tradition really carries forward um, in some ways to today, although there is a, a, a very important break point, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, but uh, I'll stop there and I'd like to say a few words of introduction about Kim, um, you know, specifically why I've, I asked her to take part in this dialogue um, by way of introduction. Um, I, I remember just when I was getting to graduate school at Columbia, uh, there appeared a notice on the library website, I think, that, uh, that a former graduate student named Kim Phillips Fine had won a big university dissertation prize. It was accompanied by this quote from, from her advisor, who I very soon found out was not given to fulsome praise of graduate students, um, to the extent that once this book came out, it would confirm Kim as one of the most exciting historians of her generation and would be required reading for anybody who cared about 20th century American politics, um, which I think most people would agree turned out to be true. Um, I know uh, from personal experience that she uh, provided an example to those of us who followed at Columbia of how you could write political history about really big questions and as a graduate student and, um, and do so in a way that would engage people in the academy and beyond. Um, more to the point, for, for present purposes, as if that weren't reason enough, um, Kim is now working on a book about the, the 1970s fiscal crisis in New York, which I view in many ways as the bookend uh, to the period that I cover in this book. Um, I'm telling a story about the strengthening of public institutions and the ways in which a robust public sector fostered a s robust democratic citizenship in the city. Um, uh, the 70s is really a period where public institutions come into disrepair but also disregard. And this seems to have a demobilizing effect on people's participation in politics and you know, measured in very straightforward ways such as voting, um, but other ways as well. Um, so I'll leave it there. That, that, that should be better. Sorry, everybody. So I, 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 was, I think this book is really important, both as a New York story, and all, but also because it's a story, um, it's a, it's a, it raises very important questions about the nature of government and the relationship between government and the market, and questions that aren't just about New York, but really the whole country. But I thought I would start out by just asking you to talk a little bit about the specific burdens and, and pleasures of writing about New York. How did you come, and, and a little more about how you came to this book. Where does it come, what, what led you to the subject, and um, what brought you to this material and these questions about Roosevelt and LaGuardia and New York? The book began, um, I was going to say years ago. It was, before the, it was before the economic collapse, I guess, is the relevant um, point, uh, as a story just about Roosevelt and LaGuardia. And it was a story then about bipartisanship. Uh, why was it that one of the most important political relationships of the first half of the 20th century happened to be between a Democratic president and a Republican mayor? That seemed odd, you know, especially at that moment, at the sort of tail end of the Bush years. Um, and it's sort of a naive question in some ways. Once you know a bit more about the trajectory of political parties in the United States, it becomes a bit more, um, it comes to make a bit more sense. But it, that still seemed an intriguing question. Um, as the project developed into a sort of general history of the New Deal in New York or something like that, um, I was intrigued by a similarly sort of simple-minded but productive question, which was really how is it possible for the government to undertake these great, you know, ambitious programs uh, 
Um, we, you know, we think of the ship of state, uh, think of the ship of state as sailing slowly in this country, right? Um, and yet, uh, just like that, sort of al almost overnight in some ways, the United States developed the most robust social spending regime in the world in the 1930s. How was that possible? And why did these things sort of hang on in New York even after the New Deal ended? Um, so th those were the sorts of questions that got me going on the topic. Um, uh, as for the city itself, um, I think this is true of urban history generally. Um, big cities like New York concentrate the, the really big forces that drive modern life, you know, whether it's the, the development of capitalism or the, the interchange of peoples and their um, transplantations into new um, places. Um, cities are places where you can see those f big forces play out on a local level and understand really what actual impact they have on people's lives. Um, so that's my, sort of my, my big picture you know, attraction to New York history. Do you have, this is a, do you have, when you were thinking of, when you were coming to the topic and thinking about it, were there particular projects, or particular New Deal projects that really captivated your imagination more than others? I mean, the, the Tribo Bridge, say, or, or what, or the swimming pools, or what do you, is there some project, um, some physical project, investment infrastructure that sums up for you what the inspiring aspects of the New Deal public investment projects were? I think it's very um, interesting that the New Dealers built both the Triborough Bridge and the swimming pools in some ways. That this impulse toward sort of helping commerce in the city develop was connected to an impulse that sort of sought to, um, you know, to intrude on places where markets had been. Uh, that these two impulses were coupled, I, I thought were interesting. It sort of from an autobiographical perspective, I would often find myself, you know, standing in front of a project or a building or something that I didn't even know was a New Deal yeah. project, you know? I think there was an early version of the, uh, of the thing that was, um, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed now to say that I didn't know this had a New Deal lineage, Bryant Park which is an older park in the city, but was completely remade in, the, in 1934 um, and given sort of its present shape. Um, you know, so I, I wrote up an outline for the thing and found out subsequently that I had done it in a New Deal right. project. <laughs> yeah, you have actually, it has a very nice website which includes these maps of New Deal New York, which are kind of guides to the different public projects around, all around the city, um, which are really a great, a great resource. So, well, I guess one question that I had about, about, um, about well, well, just about the, the New Deal in New York is that Roosevelt is often seen, and you write about this a bit in the, in the book, Roosevelt is often seen as sort of an anti, having an anti-urban bias, and that Roosevelt himself was from, you know, was, was not from a, an urban area as a child, um, and was rather skeptical about cities. And how do you account for his, I mean, for, for the types of projects in New York? And is there anything about them that you think has a kind of anti-urbanism within it? Um, you know, you, you posit that Roosevelt had this great affinity for New York, but is there anything about his projects that might, I don't know, have a, 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 a secret hostility towards the city? That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, he, uh, if it had been purely up to Roosevelt how to meet this unemployment crisis, he would have created uh, decentralized industrial plants and subsistence farming homesteads, um, which would draw people he thought were surplus right. labor in the cities out into places where they could live more cheaply and uh, in some ways have a more sort of robust American, you know, way of life. Um, he did learn to make his peace with urbanization and cities, uh, in part because it was, <laughs> became evident uh, that the, these, um, you know, these resettlement schemes were just too disruptive and big to be feasible on a large scale. Um, I think because most of the projects that were developed um, under the New Deal came from city governments, mm -hmm. there's not that much in them that can be read as really anti-urban. Yeah. However, um, 
if you look at the public housing projects from that period, for instance, there's a very clear effort to try to create suburbias in the city. Um, and of course, unintentionally, um, the New Deal did a lot to foster the development of suburbia. These are actually FDR very much disliked the suburbs that were developing in the 1920s, and there's no reason to believe he would have looked upon post-war mm -hmm. suburbia with any appreciation. But uh, nevertheless, those were the effects right. the policies had. Um, what about the role of, uh, well, I guess another, I mean, uh, many of the projects seem to be very focused on automobiles. I mean, or the, the Belt Parkway. And this brings me to Robert Moses, who I think hangs over this book, as he probably does pretty much any book, about New York. And, and, and I think in some, well, both Robert Moses and Robert Caro kind of lurk around haunting anybody who is writing about New York, I think. And so could you talk a little bit about, I mean, one of the striking things about your book is that it is a book about uh, urban development in New York, which is not about Robert Moses, and which is really placing a lot of the responsibility for these projects um, on, you know, elected officials rather than on the someone with Moses' odd kind of public but unaccountable style of authority. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that and where, how you see Moses and his relationship to the history that you're telling? Um, a lot of this treatment has to do with the fact that my book stops in 1945. Um, to begin with, things look a little different after then. Um, however, um, the way I treat Moses is Moses is a major important figure, and he is in some ways probably the third most sort of prominent figure in the, in the book, but nevertheless what Kim says is right. Um, uh, I, so we say Robert Moses built this, Robert Moses built that. Um, and in sort of a, in a literal sense you think you know, workers built this, or <laughs> workers built that, and that the, con the logical sort of extension of that is you have to think about, you know, why was labor allocated this way in the 1930s? Um, you know, and it wasn't because of Robert Moses, it was because national officials made decisions to employ um, people in these ways. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and once you sort of realize that it goes a long way to explaining how Moses developed this reputation as somebody who is singularly capable of doing these sort of remarkable things. Um, Moses' uh, Parks Department budget in, at the high tide of the New Deal was augmented by about 800% by the New Deal works programs. Um, so, you know, little wonder that it seems like he was capable of doing things that ought not to have been accomplished, you know, it, even if you, if you allow for the fact that this labor was somewhat less productive than civil service workers were, that's, st you know, that's it's still five or six times right. the resources that a parks commissioner mm -hmm. typically has in New York. Um, so the fact that he was working uh, very industriously and brilliantly under um, these extraordinary conditions um, helps to explain how he launch this extraordinary career. Yeah, no, I think that's very well put, and it's one of the things that really comes through um, in a great way in the book, is is the, I think in New York, there is a, a, a tendency to see New York as quite exceptional, and to think that ha things are happening in New York must be happening because of some peculiar quality of the place, or the people in the place, but I think the, the book really does show how a lot of what we associate with New York at this moment is really coming from the federal government and that there isn't, you know, that, that it's, it's not, you can't cut it off from the larger, the larger political economy and the larger context. Mm -hmm. that, this is, that what we think of as New York stories really might be New Deal stories instead. Along those lines, and, it, and, it, and w when you were talking about what drew you to the project with these ideas about bipartisanship, could you talk a little bit more about um, you know, nonetheless, New York did get a lot of resources from the federal government during the New Deal. And, uh, you know, could you talk about why, why that was? You know, why, why would New York have had this special relationship? And why were LaGuardia and Roosevelt able to um, have the type of relationship that they did? I mean, another way of asking this question might be to imagine there was a different mayor in place in New York instead of LaGuardia. Would New York have had the same type of experience during the New Deal, or would things have turned out differently? Right. Um, 
that, that's also a very interesting question. Um, two sort of quick counterfactuals, which we'll get at this. Um, Robert Moses came this close to being nominated for mayor in 1933 by this fusion movement that eventually chose LaGuardia. Um, had he been nominated and had he been elected, he would have gotten no support from the Roosevelt administration beyond what they had to do um, in a sort of formal sense. Um, and would not have been able to create an alliance with the labor movement probably, or at least not in the same way LaGuardia did. Um, I, think it's, I think it's probably unlikely he would have been elected anyway. Um, and had he been elected, I'm not sure he would have s served a second, let alone a third term. Um, so this fusion movement and the reform movement might have passed like a summer storm, mm -hmm. um, which would have made the politics of the city look very different. The other counterfactual is that a Democrat won in 1933, um, which very easily could have happened also had things gone a bit differently. Um, and in that case, the infusion of New Deal resources would have been put toward a political machine building effort as they were, for instance, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's the counterfactual, uh, you know, if there's no LaGuardia in some ways, is that instead of coming out of the Second World War with two pretty robust labor parties um, and this sort of fractured politics in which people who want to be mayor have to build coalitions that include social democrats and labor and all sorts of uh, all sorts of different communities, um, you would have had a somewhat reformed, but not that reformed, democratic machine that would have probably persisted for a good while, and New York would have looked somewhat like post-war Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to hear more of your thoughts on what happened to the New York machine in Tammany Hall afterwards, but maybe that's more <laughs> inside baseball <laughs> conversation. Right. Um, Another question I, I had, which is more about the broader approach of the book, is that you know, much of the time in history departments these days, people really focus on writing histories that are not centered on um, elected officials or great men or you know, kind of figure individuals with, with obvious political or social power. Mm -hmm. And your book is much is not only focused on on Roosevelt and, La and, and LaGuardia, it has a much broader scope. I mean, it, you, you do look at a wide range of different types of people and at New York more broadly, but nonetheless, it is really centered on them. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and what it's like to write this type of history today, um, whether you got any you know, pushback on that in graduate school or elsewhere, and uh, what you think are the strengths and limits of the approach. Um, the, uh, I see the book as being about democratic politics and the way in which democratic processes reshaped um, you know, the role of government, as we would say today, in New York. And in turn, how changes in what government does reshaped how people envision what they can do as citizens and how they ought to act as citizens. It uses um, these two, is sort of the two kind of paramount democratic politicians of the period as a lens from which to sort of dive into that history. If that's a bit of a mixed metaphor, but you see what I'm saying. Um, and so it's really an experiment because you know most people don't write history this way now. Um, and I was just I was kind of curious, really, to see what would happen if somebody who's schooled in contemporary approaches to political history tried to write about mm -hmm. politicians. And looking back on it now, uh, rereading the book, I see that most of the forces that make things happen are not individuals. Um, it's a, you know, it's a body of policy thought that comes out of the progressive era. It's the structures of the federal system. It's the turnover. It's the political realignment in the early 30s. It's, um, it's, it's social movements who keep the unemployment question at the front of mm -hmm. um, public debate in 1933, 34, 35. Um, it's voters. It's, uh, it's the realignment of Southern Democrats in Congress um, at, at the end of the 30s and in the 40s. Um, however, p elected officials play a very important mediating role in shaping how these, you know, these broader forces actually um, are articulated and how they 
shape outcomes. Um, and their own efforts to to build coalitions and even just you know to do what they think ought to be done is something that can't really be reduced to the point where mm -hmm. it's left out of political history. So I see them as essential both in terms of understanding how other forces that most professional historians are more apt to study um, actually come to bear in terms of producing outcomes. Um, right. But also they're interesting because they do important things in their own right. I'm not sure how we're doing on time exactly um, or... Okay, great. Well, maybe we should talk a little bit about, uh, well, I, I am interested to hear you tell a little bit of the story of the near bankruptcy of the city in the 1930s, um, and then speak a little bit about how you see it, in how it's see it in relationship to the, the 70s. But I also want to make sure to ask you a little bit about uh, the legacy of this history today in the Bloomberg era, too. So. The, the 30s story goes something like this. There are periodic fiscal crises in the city and they happen almost predictably when um, national recessions follow periods where the city government has been trying to do sort of ambitious things. Um, it, it was inevitable in 1931-32 that New York, like m most other cities in America, would come pretty close to bankruptcy and the only reason it managed to stave it off was this sort of, was an agreement brokered by the governor, Herbert Lehman, who himself was a banker with the, the major banks in the city. Um, and, uh, you know, as part of this agreement, property taxes were to be kept at a, at the level uh, that they had been. Um, and there are all sorts of other sort of financial fiscal strictures on the city, um, which would have made the 1930s a period of very sharp municipal austerity, but for mm -hmm. the New Deal. Um, how it points toward the 70s. The, nothing I don't think that happened in the 30s and 40s is a proximate cause of the fiscal crisis of the, even sort of in terms of governmental programs, it's really the expansion of, you know, spending on Medicaid, and mm -hmm. which is a 60s program. Um, however, I do think that the political culture legacy of the New Deal was a sense that this, that nothing, no s important social problem was outside the proper range of politics. And in the sense, uh, insofar as post-war New York was characterized by a very, um, uh, you know, ambitious, uh, you know, public sector, I think that political culture did set up a situation where when the national economy did turn, in particular events in the bond market did happen, um, the fiscal crisis could happen. Mm -hmm. In terms of, lastly about Bloomberg, um, to oversimplify it tremendously, um, once f national resources are withdrawn from the city in the late 30s, early 40s, um, the city starts to do on its own a lot of the things that the federal government had been helping it to do. It's able to do that through the 50s and 60s because this is a period of tremendous growth in New York, uh, much more so than in most other American cities, which actually have kind of a hard time in the 50s and 60s. The, head the headquarters economy is booming in New York, the sort of high-end real estate economy is booming in, in the city, and it's able to do with local resources what it had been doing um, through the New Deal. After the 70s, and particularly because sort of moderates, you know, chasing liberal politicians like Koch, and I think Bloomberg is sort of in this lineage also, um, they become so scared, I think. There's a deep fear of scaring off private investment in the city. Um, they look for new means to do what had been previously public functions. Mm -hmm. And this is the period where the public-private partnership really takes over um, in a major way as a sort of technology of public action. Um, I, you know, at one point I assembled a list of, you know, what had been New Deal projects which are now, you know, are now public-private partnerships and it starts with maintaining the parks. Mm -hmm. You know, all those, all those New Deal workers that Robert Moses put to work, you know, that's now the Parks Conservancies. Um, city Center, which is a, you know, in, mostly it was a quasi-public institution has been reopened much more as a non-profit um, 
and you could go on and on. But that, that's how I see the story playing out. And do you see that as having a, what, what impact do you think that that has on the political culture and on people's ideas about the state or collective action? There is a, there's an output story um, which, which goes like this. If, if these goods are provided outside of democratically accountable channels, it's almost inevitable that there will be inequalities resulting from that, right? Um, so uh, the, the High Line, which is a, a park in which a lot of wealthy people in the city are invested, um, I think has five full-time gardeners on its staff. This is coming from a, a Times report from a, a few months ago. Um, Pelham Bay Park, which is much larger in the Bronx but has a primarily working class constituency, uh, has fewer full-time maintenance employees than the High Line has staff gardeners. So that, I mean, that's a practical implication. Right. In terms of, um, uh, actually, I, I, would get, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this as, as, as somebody who's working on the 70s, which is really sort of, so my sense is that um, there's definitely a correlation between a drop in, say, voting and these public institutions from the New Deal era and the post-war period coming into sort of disrepute and being seen as resources of last resort mm -hmm. and not even really desirable for people who needed to use them. Um, how do you see these things as being connected? Um, well, I think that the, I, mean, I, I think you have a, a quote. I, I forget where it is in the book right now, but it uh, it's from somebody else, and I forget who it is. But it's it's basically saying something about how the more governments do, the more people expect them to do. And you know, uh, political scientists have written a lot about the idea of the expansion of state capacity. And I guess I do see what happened in '70s New York, and more broadly, the defunding of the public sector as a sort of that process happening in reverse. It's like the creation of state incapacity or something like that. And I, I think it does, um, I, I think it, you know, I think it does really change people's sense of what, where the power in their society lies. If you, you know, if your garbage ceases to be picked up, if your kid's school has 50 kids in a class, um, if your fire station is closing, that actually, and I think in New York, part of the political response in the short term was to try desperately to get those things back. But over time, there came to be a sense that the state wasn't going to do it and the market was the alternative. And so I think in a, in a way it does have, you know, it, it, there is a, a way in which um, the shrinking of the state does breed a sort of hostility to the state. Mm -hmm. um, Although it's it's complicated, so right, right. But I, I think uh, actually one last question about the book, and then maybe we can turn it or open it up to the audience. Um, you know, I, I I just would be curious to hear you speak a little bit about the idea of federalism, which really runs through the whole book, mm -hmm. and how and your your sense of uh, your sense of federalism and. Um, I, I guess I, many people may think about the state or the uh, kind of the power of a centralized government, but what is the, what, what do you see as the sort of federalist alternative? Could you talk a little bit about that? I, I see this in, or let's uh, back up a moment. Um, so most scholarly accounts of the New Deal and federalism um, posit federalism as a real sort of point of weakness in the New Deal state building project, um, as well as a source of, of, um, of unequal outcomes along racial lines, along gender lines, et cetera. It creates additional veto points uh, where people who are, you know, maybe more conservative can block New Deal initiatives. Um, and also a system in which sort of local uh, you know, customs can be reproduced. And, you know, this is especially important in terms of uh, preventing equal access uh, to New Deal benefits uh, in, for African Americans, mostly in southern communities and a lot of northern communities also. And you could go on and on. Um, however, I think also that the New York City case study shows that very robust outcomes were possible um, within 
the balance of the federal system. And in a lot of ways were possible because the Roosevelt administration learned how to use local governments as allies um, and as resources at a time where the national government, you know, really was a, a puny thing in a lot of ways. Um, local governments in America were very highly developed comparatively. Um, and this created freedom of action at the national level because federal officials didn't have to operate within the institutional constraints of a well-developed central state. Um, yet at the same time, uh, there were, you know, there were capacities to do all these ambitious things. Um, so that's my take on it. I, I don't at all disagree with, mm -hmm. the, with the view of federalism as a, uh, a structure which led to this unequal sort of segmented outcome, but I do think there's another part of the story. Wonderful. Well, at this time, we can actually turn it over to you guys. So if you have any questions for Mason and for Kim, we'd love to take them. Anybody? Back there? Uh, thanks very much for this fascinating talk. Um, I was curious, uh, I think the idea of bookending the sort of 30s area, you're writing about with the 70s and the middle crisis is fascinating. I was curious how you would compare, maybe how both of you would compare it to the era of federal spending that comes just before the war on poverty, right? And what's the same, what's different? There seem to be some parallels, certainly the idea of spending money directly in cities and in smaller units, as opposed to going through some of the existing federal channels. But there's also vastly different outcomes and often different opinions about these things. We can pause all kinds of things. I was curious how you met the how does, how does the infusion of resources into cities in the 30s compare with under the Great Society well, programs? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have not decided what I think about that question, but the, the place to which I've gotten uh, goes something like this. Um, you know, it, it, it was one of the features of the Great Society that, um, you know, federal officials tried to circumvent local governments, right? Um, that's a sort of, that can be understood as policy learning from the 30s in places other than, or less like New York in some ways, uh, more like Chicago. Um, I do think that um, a point of commonality is, uh, in, or in some ways wisdom from the 30s experience is the fact that um, some officials in the war on poverty understood that they were trying to build grassroots support for robust you know, social spending. Um, and that this was something they could do via policy um, seems to me to be an apt lesson to draw from the 30s experience. Um. I think, yeah, I think that the, well, I guess I would say that in, in New York, um, the, the Great Society programs, the, the federalism actually proved very problematic in New York. And it did so partly because a lot of the funding formulas were ones that were very slant, that wound up having a very heavy burden on the city. So in New York, for example, um, municipalities carried, at the time, carried 25% of their Medicaid costs. And, um, and this was a much higher proportion than in other cities, and, and it wound up being a large burden for, this, for, for New York and when the recession of the early 70s came about. And so I think there was a way in which the very different funding formulas and the amount of power that was given to different states to work out how these things would be allocated wound up being a real weakness for the programs in the long run. So again, I'm not sure exactly how that compares to the 30s, but I think it was a, a problem that came up in the... Um, you know, in the structure of the 60s programs. I mean, I also think the obvious difference with the war on poverty programs being, you know, explicitly about a means-tested population um, and always being conceived of, always thought of that way, that that was a, a real political weakness that those programs suffered from at the time and, and continue to today. It made them much easier to defund the, you know, the, the extremely brief lifespan of the Great Society as a kind of idea that had any level of currency whatsoever, I, I think it, it, was, it was very brief and it was partly because these were not universal programs, they weren't conceived of in terms of, um, you know, ending mass unemployment or, uh, or, or building projects that were going to benefit everybody, they were conceived of in terms of targeting a very poor population. And in, in a way I think they could have learned a lot from the programs of the 30s. I mean, mass building, uh, public spending that was directed at a broader end and to, to employing people 
in cities might have actually been better than some of the types of um, the, the, the way that the war on poverty actually wound up working. Maybe two little notes real quickly. In the 30s, local governments did have to contribute some um, you know, amount of local resources to, uh, to New Deal projects, but mostly they tended to be heavy capital intensive projects, which would be, you know, help the city develop and produce returns and that kind of thing. So it's politically easier than spending mm -hmm. money to help poor people, um, you know, to put it crudely. Great, I think we have time for two more questions. I'll take one out here. Uh, so we're sort of in the, in the middle of our own uh, recovery as a result of a trillion dollar capital injection. Um, how would you compare sort of the, the New Deal uh, to the 2009 stimulus? Um, very interesting. Uh, there, you could say all sorts of things about this, just maybe three very quickly. Um, the um, the bill passed in 2009, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was more than a thousand pages long. Um, the the emergency relief uh, emergency relief administration I can't remember the the big bill in 1935 that funded the WPA was five pages long when it came out of committee, which is a point about executive discretion. Um, so you know Roosevelt really did possess a lot of leeway to decide how that money would be allocated. Um, that's different now. Um, uh, the economization of public policy is another difference that comes to mind. Um, the, uh, the 2009 stimulus was really designed to restore growth to a certain level. Um, in, t in other words, macroeconomic targets. Um, the WPA was really to put people to work, uh, which is a very sort of different kind of in some ways pre-Keynesian, although it later became justified in Keynesian terms, uh, policy. Uh, and then the, the third thing just relates to um, the relationship between public and private. Um, so what was distinctive about the New Deal approach to unemployment was um, that all these people got put to work on explicitly public projects. In 2009, the Obama administration actually issued talking points at one point saying 80% of this money is going to private institutions. And in New York, from the New Deal, we have these 11 great swimming pools that people still use. Um, there is a, an actual proscription against producing swimming pools in the 2009 <laughs> stimulus measure because they thought it would be seen as a boondoggle and something that's sort of, you know, the government mm -hmm. just sort of spending money in a, in a spendthrift way. Yes, ma'am. Well, my, my personal take on it probably isn't worth much. My take on it as a historian is that this is a very, this is a process with a very long and sort of distinguished lineage in some ways. Um, the Regional Plan Association, which is this great agency from the 1920s, was already at that time drawing up plans for turning the Lower East Side of Manhattan, you know, which is still at that point you know, what we think of as the, the early 20th century Lower East Side, um, into a place where affluent residents would live within a quick commute of the Wall Street district. And, um, you know, and thinking in terms of how to decentralize industry, I mean, send it out into, you know, out of Manhattan and into the outer boroughs and the metropolitan area. Um, which, uh, you, you know, is, it's not, it, it, I, I think my own views on it are, are in some ways irrelevant, um, you know, in, in terms of the history. But um, people have been at work doing that for a very long time, is what I guess I would say in short. But the speed that it's happening in the last 10 years mm -hmm. is quite big. Yes. Yes, and public policy is being, is being put toward those ends. Wonderful. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Mason. Thank you, Kim. Um, we have copies of both of their books available over at the registers, and uh, Mason will be signing just out to my right over here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.